Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Q&A session with Michael Levin titled, Can Organismal Pattern Homeostasis Suppress Cancer? Um, it looks like I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, so I probably don't have to introduce myself, although I am Tana. Uh, for anyone who's curious, I am Perry Marshall's daughter, and I'm just here to keep things peaceful today. So uh, not that they haven't been before. So um, thank you, Michael, for being here, and feel free to take it away. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, I was asked to just take two minutes and um, uh, sort of uh, speak to uh, the overall approach that we take to this problem. So uh, just briefly to summarize what we do, um, I view uh, cancer as a really important component of this general uh, theme where individual cells being highly competent agents have to work together on global uh, anatomical goals. So cells have to cooperate in order to build a face, a kidney, a body, you know, whatever. And so uh, cancer is a, uh, to me, is a very natural disorder of this communication network that binds smaller uh, uh, competent agents into a larger group agent with its own large scale goals. And so when that process goes awry and individual cells get isolated from the, the cues that normally share their information with the rest of the network, then they, they revert back to their sort of unicellular ancient behavior and they go where they want, they eat what they want, they, uh, they, they basically metastasize and treat the rest of the body as just environment, right? So to, to, to us, it, this, this boundary between um, an agent, a, a self and the outside world is very important and this boundary can shrink or grow. So during embryonic development, it grows from the scale of one cell, the fertilized egg, to the size of a whole body or, or various organs therein. But it can also shrink when that, when that communication process breaks down. It can shrink and go back to being individuals, uh, individual cells. So uh, to us, this is, this, this is it's an important twist on kind of game theory approaches to this problem because it's not that the cancer cells are more selfish than any normal cell. Every, everything is selfish. It's just that the size of the self is different. So, so cancer cells, they're, the self to which they are selfish is very small and individual whole animals are, are selfish in their um, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, relationships with others, but that's a much bigger self. And so this, the scale of the self can grow and shrink during this process. So specifically what we look at are bioelectrical ways by which cells um, connect to each other. And uh, it's very important uh, because uh, they, you know, this, this electrical um, signaling is a way in which the cells can, can merge into uh, functional networks that, that actually d um, obscure some of their individuality and bind them into, a, uh, into, into global, um, uh, global uh, uh, entities like organs and so on. And so uh, what we've been developing are ways to observe this electrical communication and ways to perturb it. So either shut it down, which which promotes um, metastasis, or to uh, artificially enforce it, which actually can suppress tumorigenesis and metastasis. So that's kind of the long, um, the long and the short of it. All right, Ken says, how do you view the cancer cell self as different than a protist cancer cell self? Are the rules of engagement different? Yeah, re really, um, really great question. Uh, we are still in the process of, of, of figuring this out. I mean, the the things that we see cells, in individual cells doing are very similar to the kinds of things that uh, that, that, that protists do. And one, one thing that's, um, you know, that's different about dealing with mammals versus uh, versus amphibians is that when you take cells out of a mammal, the oh, out, the external environment is extremely extremely different, right? Because they expect temperature and and and, and you know uh, uh, various conditions, so you don't really expect those cells to live by themselves. But if you think about, I mean, I just wrote a paper about this that's going to be out in in a few weeks. You can think about um, a fish or a frog in a pond uh, that dies the animal dies, but most of the cells are usually actually alive at that point. And you can imagine, um, 
you can imagine uh, some of those cells making their way out of the body and continuing life as amoebas, basically, because the external environment isn't really that different. So the temperature is about the same, they're cold blooded. So um, then you have interesting questions about what's alive and what's not alive, because some of the cells can go on and have independent uh, lives as amoebas outside. So this connection, I think uh, there's a lot to be uh, to be learned here that we don't really know yet. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so then Christian Linhart would like to know, do you think that a local or system wide deficiency in the elements which are used in the ion channels for cell to cell communication could cause the communication system to malfunction and therefore contribute to cancer, for example, magnesium deficiency? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, um, so, so generally speaking, uh, changes in uh, ion levels are not sufficient to trigger gap junctional um, uh, disengagement because these circuits have evolved for a long time to be robust to physiological changes, right? So, so they're used to, these networks are used to uh, making up for excess potassium, excess sodium, things like this. They generally f fight back pretty well against that. Um, you need to do some pretty clever tricks to overcome it, which is, you know, it took us 10 years to learn to do this in, in vivo because the circuits are pretty robust. However, there are, of course, stories about excess sodium uh, being uh, being important in, in promoting cancer. There are a bunch of papers trying to get people to shift to potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride for table salt, which obviously nobody wants to do. It tastes terrible. Um, but but so there may well be a story like that, but it, it's not obvious mechanistically. Um, changing ion levels doesn't usually, it's not usually alone enough to do this. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Jim Shapiro would like to know, Michael, please explain how you alter the electrical field. Did you, do you turn on open ion channels onto genetically? Also, we seem to have lost your video. Yep, just one second. I, okay, no worries at all. The camera, I'm still, I'm still here. Um, yeah, so, so we have a variety of, uh, here we go. Yeah, so we to, my, excuse me, Michael, it should be optogenetically. Sure, sure, yep. Uh, yeah, um, so, so we have a variety of ways of doing it. We have absolutely done it optogenetically. Um, there are often easier ways to do it with drugs, so channel openers and blockers, sometimes with more uh, traditional genetic techniques, so we can delete channels, we can put in new channels, um, all of those work. And, and yeah, optogenetics, of course, is the highest resolution uh, system as far as the spatial control. Um, well, if anyone has other questions, feel free to come off of mute. Henry, do you have a question? Yes, I have a, hi, Michael, <laughs> enjoy your talk. Yeah, Thank you. so the, you just mentioned the, all the self regulate in the way in the just different scale, right? But the thing is if the cell is a different type, for example, therefore the, the mechanism of regulation is still similar a lot. So the, the reason I ask this is what is the limitation of the embryogenic control constraint in terms of cancer, I mean, when it become very powerful, they still follow the same rule. Or yeah, not? yeah, great, great question. So, um, I I think uh, the the cells are for two reasons. And I'll give you two examples why I think cells, n normal cells, are incredibly good at working together despite differences in cell type. Uh, you know. Um, to do, well, one example is we we do, we do a lot of chimerism and we make uh, uh, embryonic chimeras out of completely different species. So we have a thing we call a frogolotl, which is basically part frog embryo, part axolotl. And so now these cells genetically are uh, quite different. They, there's you know millions of years of separation and they have absolutely no problem working together. Um, they, you know, it, it, it builds uh, something. Um, we we have also made uh, synthetic living machines that are basically crazy combinations of different cell types that we sort of bioengineer into specific um, arrangements. There's a lot of self-organization that happens. You get a functional, motile creature out of that, a living, functional body that works. So uh, as long as the cells are able to actively communicate with each other, I think um, you will get cooperation. And I want to say one specific thing. It's kind of subtle. I want to say one specific thing about 
electrical communication as opposed to other kinds of communication. So obviously cells have many ways to communicate with each other, right? There's chemical signals, biomechanics, uh, matrix, molecules, all of that. What makes elect electrical signaling unique is the following. Imagine two cells that are connected by, uh, that are communicating by chemical secretion and receptors. When, when you have the system, the recipient cell that's receiving the signal, it's very clear to that cell that the signal comes from outside. In other words, that cell, you can, it can choose to ignore the signal, it can choose to act on it, it knows the signal is coming from outside and it has an easy time maintaining individuality and then it can process that information or not. Gap junctional connectivity, electrical connectivity with these electrical synapses known as gap junctions is completely different because what you see there are two cells that are, their internal milieus are directly connected by this gap junction. Molecules directly go in and out. What that means is that the cells, to the extent that the gap junction is open and significant in, in uh, conductivity, it means that cells have a really hard time maintaining individuality because let's say something happens to cell A and it generates a calcium spike. Well, that calcium spike propagates into cell B, which now, because calcium doesn't have metadata on it that says, where did I, you know, where did you come from? Cell B has no way of knowing whether that, the event that triggered that calcium happened to it or happened to its connected neighbor. OK, and, as, and so so you get this this syncytium almost where the individual boundaries of the of the two cells are partly erased, where it becomes really hard for the cells to maintain the, uh, their own molecular memory of, of the events that 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 they that they you know, were, were a part of. And uh, so so it erases it erases identity off the signaling and it also makes it very difficult for the cells to cheat. Because in a, in a game theory evolution uh, kind of sense, because if your internal physiology is directly connected to that for, of your neighbor, anything bad you do to your neighbor, is in, you're, you're going to immediately, within seconds, you're going to get the consequences of it. If you try to poison your neighbor, guess what? You're going to be, you're going to get it momentarily as it comes through the gap junction. So these bystander effects that people have been reporting forever that are often gap junctionally mediated are just a sign of this uh in incredible um scale up that gap junctions enable both both on the physiological level and and this in terms of cooperativity it becomes impossible not to cooperate because the boundary between you and your neighbor is partially erased right it's physically it becomes physically very very difficult to cheat and um there's lots more uh, i could say about this but i think i think these gap junctions uh enable cells of all types to, uh, to, to, to merge into larger syncytia. And, and so, it's, so it's not an accident, you know, in the, in the cancer field, it's one of the oldest data of, you know, that the, one of the first things that, come, that happens after transformation is a loss of gap junctional connectivity. So when cells transform, first thing they do is they cut off their electrical uh, connections. And, and, that's, and that's critical that in order for them to behave independently, th that's, that's absolutely essential. Ken says, do you see differences in how cancer cells interact with each other via gap junctions versus how they interact with immune cells? Oh boy, there's a lot of work to do on that. We don't know. Um, people have, there have been interesting um, studies of gap junctional connectivity in tumors where apparently, and I don't know, I, I can't say much about immune cells in this context, but, but the one thing I know is that people have noticed that after the gap junctional connectivity drops and the cells can transform, then they make a tumor. And oftentimes the gap, the connectivity within the tumor is quite significant, not between the tumor and the healthy tissue, but within the tumor. And my conjecture, and we have not really pursued this yet, but my conjecture is that what you're getting is a secondary reboot of embryogenesis that basically these independent cells that have, they've detached from the mothership, they've gone on their own, but now they're able to connect with each other and form a tiny sort of mini embryo. And there have been a bunch of papers lately on, on tumors as organs because of that. And I think they're, they're, yes, they're tumors as organs, but I also think they're tumors as organisms. I think they're actually sort of re rebooting a primitive kind of uh, embryogenesis. And they've, they've decided that they're going to communicate within themselves. But the external body is just environment. You know, you don't want gap junctions to your environment. So, um, I think there are sort of multiple phases. They're sort of recapitulating that evolutionary journey from single cells to some sort of collective. And, and it's very much like 
what we see in our synthetic living machines where we pile together a bunch of cells that you know in weird configurations and they figure out how to connect to each other and they form a novel creature that's never existed before so have you um seen uh or has anybody done sort of the temporospatial breaking of the gap junctions and then the reformation of the gap junctions um well people have certainly done that in the cell biology context so so there are some very high resolution studies of, of you know what that looks like molecularly and all that um i have not seen terribly much of that in the specifically in the cancer literature i think there's a ton of uh, available um work to do here on that i think that would be very important to do in uh sort of clinically relevant in vitro model systems but it hasn't been done yet how quickly can a gap junction form a single gap junction can form very quickly but of course there's not just one there are lots of them the other cool thing about gap junctions is that they are controllable. So, so when two cells are connected by gap junctions, each side can determine whether or not the gap junction stays open. So not only are they a sort of controllable signaling valves, they are also synapses in the sense that they are um, themselves uh, voltage gated. So this means that they are experienced, it's an experience dependent uh, uh, synapse. It's the you know, classic synaptic plasticity, but based on what happened previously, meaning the voltage was up or down, the gap junction will be open and closed. And so it has a historicity to it. And it is a, uh, a voltage gated current conductance. And then another way of saying that is a transistor. So once you have that, once you have a voltage gated current conductance, uh, you have a transistor and you can build almost anything computationally, right? You can make logic gates, you can make whatever you want. So it's an extremely uh, sophisticated piece of technology that allows computation in cell, um, cell groups. Any other questions, Ken, before I move on to the chat? Uh, I, I've got, go, go ahead, go to the chat. All right, awesome. Uh, Doru Paul would like to know, any relationship with the NovaCare treatment using tumor treatment fields or the work uh, or the work of Dr. Boris Pashi at Wake Forest using electromagnetic fields? Uh, and then attached to that was tumor specific amplitude mo modulated radio frequency electromagnetic fields induce differentiation of hepatocellular carcinoma via targeting not going to read that part, voltage gated calcium channels and calcium two influx. Yeah. Um, so, right. Uh, b b both this and the Novacure. So, so the thing, the thing is uh, for sure, applied electromagnetic fields have effects on living systems. There's no doubt, but the mechanisms through which they couple is probably not the kind of thing that we're studying here. So there's, there are lots of different ways for applied electromagnetic fields to affect um, cells. Um, some of them may well be relevant to cancer, I'm, I'm sure, uh, but they are unlikely to be doing it by virtue of modulating um, resting voltage states. You know, uh, resting, resting uh, membrane potentials and, and ion channel states are very difficult to control with these external fields. I, I, that's probably not how these things are working. Um, but I, you know, I, I don't have an opinion on whether or not they're working. I, I think it's quite likely that they are, but it's probably not through this system. Could, could I ask you one more question? Just, just to follow up on, uh, sorry, just to follow up on this idea. So, I mean, the novel cure is currently approved for the treatment of glioblastoma and also for the treatment um, of um, uh, some of the, uh, the lung uh, mesothelioma, some of the lung uh, uh, cancers. And they're looking also for approval in other types of cancer. And this is a, a low electrostatic field. I was wondering if, uh, you know, using um, your approach, I mean, are you purely thinking about drugs that are modulating the, um, uh, the receptors or you can also think in terms of uh, some type of electrostatic field that can be applied? Uh, to treat uh, tumors? Yeah, um, I, I think it's going to be hard to modulate this system with electrostatic fields. I think my, my memory from, I, I saw a talk from Novacure a while back, and if what I remember is that they were actually have, having an effect on uh, uh, chromosome segregation, you know, that, that, that what they were affecting is the ability of cells to, to mitose, basically. Um, 
I think that it, applied applied electrodes are probably not a great uh, modulation for the for the resting potential. We are focused on drugs, so we are focused on um, ion channel, small molecule ion channel drugs to drive cells into correct uh, states and uh, and 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 you know uh, produce those those nice open gap junctions that will let cells be uh, better integrated into a whole. A lot of studies have been retrospective and looking at, you know, at all uh, these uh, modulators of the ion channels um, in uh, patients taking already some of these agents. Was, did, you, did you look in any, anything like that to see if uh, uh, any blockers uh, in patients that have high blood pressure or something, they, they are associated with some increase in survival? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I've, I've talked to epidemiologists about this. And what they and which is not my field at all. Um, what they basically tell me is that it's way too difficult to um, make any conclusions because of confounds. So, for example, one of the things that we found years ago is that uh, uh, serotonin is an important part of how voltage uh, turns on voltage drop turns on melanoma. So, and and in fact, in that in our model system, uh, serotonin uh, reuptake inhibitors like Prozac or fluoxetine block the process, you know, completely 100%. So I said, okay, great. Let's look at the population of people on Prozac and see if they have lower, you know, lower rates of melanoma. Well, of course, the problem is if you're depressed, maybe you don't go outside as much. And then it's not that, you know, apples and oranges. So basically every conversation uh, around the epidemiology has ended up in that it's being too difficult to actually get anything out of it. So, but, but I, I had the same, I had the same idea. I think, I think it's a good, it's a good question. I think it would be great if you have an animal model, you know, and you give uh, them something like that, and then you see what's going on. So you have a proof of principle, and if, if you see a modification in the uh, resting potential, then you can have some type of uh, biological link, and then you can do, do a randomized study, you know, in, so, or a study, not a randomized, but just start with a phase one or phase two study and uh, add the Prozac to some uh, patients in low doses that don't have depression, actually. Right. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I mean, that's b way beyond my depth to plan studies like this. So I, you know, I would love to work with actually in just in general, you know, if a, for all the clinicians on the on the call, anybody who's interested in doing this stuff, I would love to work with people who work with clinically relevant models with real patients. There's a ton of things to do now. We, we you know, we know what to do, but we're not going to be the ones to do some of this. So sure. we need, we need Thank you. Yeah. I, I will get in touch with you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah, drop an email. Yeah, that's great. So, so, Michael, do you uh, consider the uh, phys physical software is a one type of uh, long genetic information? Yeah, I mean, I've argued uh, for a while that that the bioelectrical network uh, specifically enables a kind of software, and the reason I call it software is because it is reprogrammable. It means that using stimuli, not not rewiring, not genetic editing, not transcriptional rewiring. But uh, brief stimuli, uh, you can change the system state without having to change the hardware. The hardware being the pro, you know the proteome of, of, of the cell. So I think I think from that perspective, it absolutely is a kind of uh, software. And we've been you know in the let's say in the developmental biology side of the lab, we've been trying to reverse engineer this software. So like we found modules, we found triggers of things that make eyes and hearts and limbs and brain size and things like this. So we're in the process of trying to reverse engineer that software um, and find out what all the sort of modules of the subroutines and the trigger call, the trigger points are. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. So, so, so what's the uh, your view about the hardware and the software? How actually, the, you know, the, which yeah. way linked? Yeah. So I think I think, and this is not a popular view because I think most, you know, mostly we're told that the genome is the software and that the cell is the hardware. So I think that's wrong, um, or at least incomplete. I think that the hardware is, in fact, the, what the what the genome does is specifies the hardware. So the genetics tells each cell what proteins it gets to have, including ion channels, gap junctions, all of that. Uh, now, what evolution does is it. Um, it, it sort of uh, sculpts and refines that hardware so that when it's put together in a tissue and the juice is turned on, so to speak, the metabolics kick in, uh, it, is, uh, it has a default behavior that is ecologically um, you know, adaptive, right? And so, so, that's, so that's what the hardware does. The hardware is, is the choice of ion channels is sculpted by evolution to provide a really powerful set of software that has a default behavior. 
What's cool about it is that you can move it off of that default behavior and ask it to do different things, but it has a really robust default outcome, which is what you see during normal embryogenesis and, and health and all of that. Um, so I think, I think that's, that's kind of the relationship here between hardware and software. So, um, Mike, just to go back to the the idea that each um, cell, is sort of in a gap junction, has to partner and can control that that interface. How does that work when one wants to let go and one doesn't? For example, like a cancer cell and a T cell. Yeah. So, so, so there are the devils in the details as far as what type of gap junction and all of that. But roughly speaking, the dynamics are these. In order to open the gap junction, both cells have to have the right conditions. Both cells have to agree. But once that gap junction is open, you no longer have, uh, as, as a cell, once you open a gap junction to your neighbor, you no longer have complete autonomy because if current or other small metabolic signals come from that neighbor, they, they, they come inside of your cytoplasm, they may prevent that gap junction from ever being closed again. So what you're doing when you're opening a gap, uh, a gap junction is uh, you're, you're making yourself vulnerable to um, potential control by whatever you're connected to. And it may, be, it may end up being a one-way trip because, yeah. So do, do, um, does, um, has, has anybody understood, like obviously if a T cell latches on, it, it's gonna you, you know, wanna take that to completion of, of killing the, the, the cancer cell or whatever it's attached to. Does it, it has it, it does it pour in more electricity, so to speak? How does it override? You know, like what's the signal that overrides um, the ability of the other cell to just say, "I don't want to be here." Yeah, yeah. Um, so there are a, there are a wide variety of things that go through the gap junctions. It's not just current. There's the small metabolites. There's all you know calcium. There's all kinds of stuff that goes in. But a, a simple case is just is just voltage. If you know if you're very depolarized and you attach to a cell that was normally polarized, you basically at more or less average out the voltage. And now if that voltage is such that the gap junction won't close, well, that's it. And it's not going to close. And now you have a general, you know, you have an average voltage potential. That's just, it is what it is. And, and uh, both, both sides contribute to it and the other cell can try to fight it, but it's, it's a loss of autonomy. You know, that's what this whole thing is about is, is, is erasing that autonomy. Um can I ask another um, sort of sim simple, stupid question? Um, it's been known for years uh, that cancer cells are much more negatively charged uh, than you know normal tissue cells, and that's generally um, explained by you know glycoproteins and 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 having more you know negatively charged hyaluronic acid, et cetera, et cetera. But um, how do how do you fit that? paradigm of a negative just always being more negatively charged into your way of thinking yeah so let me show you um i'm gonna try i've got a slide i, I i'll sh uh, let me um uh let me see if i can if i can find it here uh, yeah here we go uh all right i'm going to try to share the screen so where is it oh my god it's not here Hang on. Um, it's probably lost in your books behind you. Yeah, it might be. Uh, man, I, I'm, I'm having trouble finding it. Okay, I'll, I'll find it later and, 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 and send it to you. So, so, here's, so here's the thing. Um, I don't know about static charges, but, but generally speaking, and I've, I, I used to show this slide whenever I would talk about this stuff, I showed this slide that um, you start out with a bunch of different cell types and they all have different resting potentials. So we're not talking about static charge. I don't know about that, but resting potentials, the difference between inside and out. So you have all these different cell types, uh, you know, tumor cells, stem cells, embryonic cells, you know, mature somatic cells, and they're all over the place. And you say, wouldn't it be cool if there was some way to organize them? And then uh, I simply, I, I have a little animation that just places them all on one axis from depolarized to hyperpolarized. And what you see is something very interesting that all of the, the, the stem cells, the embryonic cells, and the cancer cells end up very depolarized, meaning that the, the VMEM is closer to zero. The difference between inside and outside is less, and all the quiescent somatic uh, terminally differentiated cells are hyperpolarized. It's an amazing relationship, okay? Um, the reason I stopped showing the slide 
is that people would get super fixated on that and they would get this idea that it's that it's a single cell property right that, that cancer is a disease of a single cell that's in the wrong state and i think that's fun long term i think that's mistaken i think this this whole thing is about cell to cell communication but the fact remains that yeah it, it, transformed cells tend to be depolarized we've developed uh voltage sensitive dyes that show you uh pre-cancer in in the frog model and they show you um, tumor margins so my, you know, one of one of the dreams here is to transition this to mammals, so that if you are uh, at home, uh, you want to want to scan yourself for um, uh, for for skin cancer, or if you're a doctor doing surgery and you want to know where the margins are, you've got this voltage sensitive fluorescent gel that you can put in and and see where all the weird depolarized cells are. So uh, you know, I, I and 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 why are they depolarized? Um, one of the things that depolarization tends to do is to shut down the gap junctions. So what we see in the frog is you put in your, your oncogene, let's say your, your, your KRAS mutant, you put in your KRAS mutation, immediately the cell depolarizes. And if you let it, uh, the next thing that happens is it loses gap junctional connectivity and then, and then it takes off and, and it makes, you know, goes off on its own. So that, those are the, those are the parts where you can, you can intervene. You can, you can intervene in that, in that cascade. So uh, just to fo follow uh, the question at, at that bit, do you think when you use a frog, so all the species that can easily regenerate the body parts. So are those, in general, these species have more stem cell proportionally? So this is a, this is a very, uh, very good question. So there, there is this general, f okay, so, so if you have a standard view on cancer, where you know cell cycle checkpoints and and things like this you would predict that animals that have a large number of plastic de-differentiated cells ought to be very cancer prone okay and uh this is exactly backwards so what you see is that animals that are highly regenerative that have tons of uh plastic cells that are able to de-differentiate de at the drop of a hat those those types of animals are generally extremely resistant to cancer and I think it's because we ought to be not thinking about this at the single cell level where you're talking about uh, stem cells and things like this, but, but at the level of how much control can that animal muster to harness individual cell behaviors towards organogenesis. If that control is weak, like animals that don't regenerate at all, and frogs actually aren't very good regenerators a little bit, but not, not, nothing like salamanders, um, then, then they'll be cancer prone. And the best example of that is planarian. So in planaria, these flatworms that we work with, that animal is 30% stem cells. About, about a third of that animal is stem cells that can make anything. The planaria are incredibly regenerative. You can cut them into pieces any way you like. The record is something like 276 pieces. Every piece will, will give you a tiny, perfect little worm. All, this, you know, all of these uh, uh, stem cells are constantly throwing off proliferative progeny. They, the thing grows like crazy. Um, it it uh, it will regenerate uh, after any kind of damage, and they have very very low cancer rates, and they are immortal. They there is no such thing as an old planarian. Individual cells senesce and die, but they regenerate them. And they the worms that we have in our lab are basically the worms that were here half a billion years ago. These are they're the same worm. They don't they do not age at the level of the organism, despite. You know, people talk about aging, you know, the, the, the cancer risk of long life and all this. It doesn't have to be that way. Planaria are clearly telling us that it does not have to be that way. If you have an incredibly strong, and in fact, there's one other thing to say about planaria. Because they can reproduce asexually, meaning they tear themselves in half and then they regenerate, it means that they have somatic inheritance. So unlike us, if you get a mutation in your arm, your children don't get the mutation, right? Planaria are not like that. Any mutation that doesn't kill the cell makes it into the next generation because every piece of the planarian continues into the next generation. So for 400 million years, they have been accumulating mutations. Their genomes are an incredible mess. We don't even have a genomic assembly because you don't know what the heck you're sequencing when you sequence these things. They are mixoploid. Every cell has a different number of chromosomes. It's, it's just a total mess and yet no cancer, 100% uh, perfect anatomical fidelity. Every time you cut them, you get a perfect little worm, 100% of the time. Uh, so uh, what that tells us is that 
the integrity of uh, of the of the genome does not have a simple relationship with with cancer. It tells us that simply being packed with plastic stem cells does not predispose you to cancer. What you need to avoid cancer is an incredibly strong patterning capacity that will take all of those new cells and harness them to a specific anatomical endpoint. And the other cool thing about planaria is that if you do give them cancer, which is possible to do with really nasty chemicals, um, you let's say they get a tumor on their head, you cut off the tail, and as they regenerate, because every cell, they, they sort of remodel, every cell participates in the regeneration event, those tumors get normalized and they become normal tissue. So, so they will, during a process, much like salamander limbs, during the regenerative process, they will, uh, they will normalize those cancer cells. So, so, so it's quite interesting to actually think in your system because uh, we know the uh, so-called so the, uh, the field development or, or something that have much flexible, but the problem is that such a functional or phenotype cannot be passed by. So therefore there's lost the evolutionary meaning because just like your system, every time the DNA is changed, everything is changed. So there actually is not the same thing already. But then we have a similar morphological constraint for some reason, right? Yeah, so I'm not sure I understood the question. Are you saying why are humans more constrained no, no. than planaria? I'm thinking is a, a, lots of a, a, a so-called so higher animal, everything. So the, actually the, 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 the self-organization package is, is highly inherited, right? So that's, that's how, how about I ask a different way? So do you think different animals have different body plan, therefore have different uh, software. This software actually is inherited by the genome, right? So, so, so therefore for that system, the, every time the dividing with different gene, different gene mutation, the actually we should define is different system. This is a cluster of different system, but with a similar morphological feature. Yeah, yeah, I think, well, so there's a lot, there was a lot there. I think that um, one thing to talk about different body plans is uh, to keep in mind different lifestyles. So with only one exception that I know of, all good regenerators are aquatic. So, so all good regenerators uh, live in water. And, one, and, and so you can think about why, you know, why are humans not so regenerative? Let's, let's look at limb regeneration, right? Salamanders regenerate their limbs. Why don't humans regenerate their limbs? So think back to our ancestors. You're like a little mouse, like uh, early, early mammal, and you're running around the forest and somebody bites your leg off. So you've got a rapid heartbeat and a high blood pressure. You're stepping, you're, you're load bearing, the limbs are load bearing. You're gonna bleed out long before you get a chance to, to, to regenerate that limb. You know, you're, a salamander can sort of hang out in the water and not put any weight on it and go hide for a few weeks and, and, and it has time. If, if you're a mouse, regenerating your limb while you're trying to run on it and grinding it into the forest floor is probably not adaptive at all. So I think what happened to mammals is that they shifted to scarring and away from regeneration because it just wasn't as a day you know your number one when you're a mouse and somebody bites your leg off your number one problem is bleeding out it's not how are you going to regenerate your limb over the next six months so i think you know uh the light and i'm sure there are other physi aspects of the physiology that i don't know about i think i think mammals have have, have done this uh thing where they just go to scarring and i don't think it's because they're unable to regenerate i think it's because they've uh, evolution has, has, has taken them a different way, but all of the basic mechanisms of regeneration are still there. And the reason you know they're still there is because of things like monozygotic twins. So when you take an early embryo, a human or a mouse or whatever, early mammalian embryo, and you cut it in half, you don't get two half embryos, you get two perfectly normal individuals. So that system knows perfectly well how to say that, oh my God, half of me is missing. I'm, I know exactly what's missing. I'm gonna regenerate exactly what's needed and I'm gonna repattern the whole thing and rescale it so that you get one normal human out, on each, out of each one. So it's not that we've, we, we, it's not that ourselves don't have the software. It's just the default setting is scarring versus regeneration. That's, that's you know, what I think. And the only exception to all of this is deer. So deer regenerate their antlers um, very, you know, extremely, extremely strongly. Uh, every, every year they grow up to, uh, I think, a centimeter and a half of new bone per day. And it's crazy rates of bone growth. And I think the deal with deer is that those antlers are not load bearing. 
you never have to think about, um, to, to, you know, stepping on it or whatever. You sort of carry it up there and, and it's okay. And I think that's probably one major, the other thing about water, which I don't have an explanation for what, how the deer do it, but I, but I always thought that the other cool thing about water is that in an aqueous environment, you, you can run um, extracellular ion currents. So you can drive a strong uh, wound epithelium with all the ion currents that are what's responsible for regeneration in, in, in most systems. You can't do that in dry air. In dry air, you're not, you're not running any currents. So I think that's a part of it, and, but I admit I don't know how the deer manage it. No. Uh, speaking of traumatic things happening to mammals, in people with high levels of PTSD, they have double the risk of developing ovarian cancer. Yeah. And I'm wondering if repeated activation of the uh, HPA axis and the SAM axis induces depolarization. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, the, the, connection, uh, the connection to um, uh, hormones is uh, super, super interesting and important. We only have begun to scratch the surface. Uh, we recently showed that progesterone applied to a limb regeneration wound is extremely, um, to an amputation basically, is extremely um, potent in driving uh, limb repair. Limb repair, and I'm sure there's a cool connection here between the bioelectrics and the hormones, but we haven't even we haven't even scratched it yet. Yeah, I'm just wondering if there's anything on adrenaline or cortisol, the other fight or flight hormones inducing uh, depolarization or carcinogenesis because of the increased race, rate of cancer among people with psychological injuries. Yeah, really, really important. Um, I don't know, that needs to be looked at and also neurotransmitters. So we know that serotonin, for example, is hugely involved in both setting and responding to uh, bioelectric signals. So I wouldn't be at all shocked if there was a, an important, you know, sort of psychological component to this, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. I, I think that means that all Americans are going to get cancer from the election turmoil that we're having right now. <laughs> we are all fucked. <laughs> well, yeah, stress certainly doesn't help. Uh, that's that's for sure. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so Ken just asked on the chat, what fundamental niche does planaria occupy that keeps it from evolving? Well, I don't know that they're not evolving. It's just, I think they found a really, um, I mean, they, they found a really successful way to be. And I think, you know, they maybe have evolved and whatever they evolved into now isn't a planarian, it's something else. I don't remember the exact tree and, and where they sit, but um, planaria are, are amazing for a number of reasons. First, I mean, aside from being highly regenerative and immortal, they're also smart so they can learn and we you can train them and and you know they're pretty um they're, they're, they're pretty smart uh and they have all kinds of interesting rich behaviors um uh, you know they're kind of the full package so to speak I, I you know it's a very successful um body you know body structure the next question was uh from doru what is going on with the hate flick limit on the planaria do they have a high telomerase in the cells? No idea. I would assume that somebody who studies that kind of stuff would have already looked. Uh, so I've never come across those studies. Um, it's kind of a, weird to me that that's already not a, a you know a well known um, story that somebody would have worked up. Don't know. I've never heard of. I've never heard of anything like that. His second question was: Is depolarization influenced by the pH level in the stroma? Um, it can be. There are certainly pH uh, activated channels, so I think it's totally plausible. Um, I'm trying to think of if I know a specific story about that. I don't think I do, but uh, it's certainly plausible. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Excellent. Any other questions, everybody? Yeah. So I have uh, uh, one information. So the, we actually uh, years ago to try to think about the why the asexual is such so diverse and the lots of you know, but we actually later on we 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 realized that the uh, uh, you know for the species with meiosis right so they're actually checking the information so for those species they actually have a chance to accumulate some of the feature 
But if you keep changing, you actually, you, you are not who you are. Every time is, is different, but it's quantitatively speaking, how much you are different they are. So we did the computer simulation. We found that for the asexual system, they're just, the, just the, like the fuzzy cluster tree. And uh, in that sense, we're thinking now bacteria is very different from ancient bacteria, if you actually really want to study the uh, uh, genotype as such. But, uh, but so, so that could apply to the system you are using is because as you just mentioned, every cell have different gene mutation, different chromosomes, they just continue doing diffuse by different system. But if they can fix up, then they can gradually let Darwinian stepwise, you know, aiden up become possible. Otherwise it's, it's completely fluid, it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, that's quite interesting. Um, I we we have a paper that just came out. Uh, Chris Fields and I on um, the evolution of sex and multicellularity and all that. Um, you could take a look, but that that's really interesting. That's a very interesting point. I think that's important. I think that's important. Yeah. Go ahead, William. You're uh, you're still muted. I just asked to unmute you. Hi, Mike. Um, the uh, um, in my studies, um, the pathways that I found uh, as a ca causal pathways were embryonic pathways um, almost exclusively. Just what, um, what is your comment on that um, as far as cancer goes? Maybe Henry, you wanna weigh in on this too, but it, it appeared that most of the time we were, I was finding that they were also embryonic pathways that were being uh, upregulated or, or downregulated in certain cases. Yeah, I think that makes total sense because the things that we <clears throat> call embryonic pathways are exactly the kinds of things that need to be uh, regulated in order to have a multicellular, you know, uh, architecture go on. Uh, there's another interesting kind of if you if you know if everything I've been saying so far isn't weird enough. It, there's a we, even even stranger way to look at things, which is that one one thing that we've done we've done some bioinformatics to look at genes that are normally associated with um, cognition so memory and learning and and disorders of memory and learning and things like this and if you just look at um at the overlap between genes implicated in development in cancer and in cognition the the sort of venn diagram the overlap there is something was something like 60 fold enrichment over random categories i mean these things are very related to each other in the sense that what the cells are doing is they're making decisions all the time. The cells and the tissues are making decisions about uh, what they're going to do uh, sort of morphogenetically and who's going to connect to whom and why. Um, and these are all genes that are being reused by evolution for figuring out the body plan and for figuring out behavior, both at the cellular level and at the you know sort of brain level. So this is all um, that's that's a whole other category of genes that are in there, and there's massive overlap with 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 um, embryonic development and with um, cancer. You're muted, Henry. To follow up this question, Mike, do you think in the different stage of development, so the cognition actually different type of be, become dominant in each stage? Sorry. So, for, for example, at the embryonic stage, there may be just, uh, you know, the, the cellular simple communication become very dominant. But later on, when the brain power, everything, so they actually just take over or the all exist just. Uh, yeah, I think I think it's hard to see that at the transcriptional level, because the same genes, you know, things we call neural genes are they, these things are on from the single cell stage in development, right? So all the ion channels, the gap junctions, the synaptic machinery, all that stuff is on in early development. So it, it's not that it isn't there. It's more or, or that, the, you know, the genes come on later. It's that the information um, processing is different. So we, we work with a group at Arizona State that uh, studies um, causal information theory, and they have a way of looking at signaling and sort of getting estimates of computation and who who's talking to whom and and how much information is being passed and so on and that most certainly changes during develop during development uh you know and it gets progressively more uh, more rich but it's there from from the word go i mean bacterial biofilms do this there are some lovely papers 
uh, recently um, from UCSD showing how they're very brain-like signaling in uh, bacterial biofilms, because I think evolution found these electrical dynamics really early, you know. Following up of, on what you just said, you know, that uh, you saw an increase 60-fold over randomness with this embryonic development, cancer, and cognition. Paul Davis presented a very interesting um, analysis of um, uh, development, you know, through um, uh, different species. And, you know, you had uh, monocellular species and have pluricellular species. And there was looking at the cancer um, genome which one resembles what? And he said that 40% is actually related to this uh, one cells, and then you have 60% uh, related to the multicellular uh, you know, species. So I was wondering if when you're doing this uh, analysis of the genes for embryonal development, cancer, et cetera, if you go further and you combine the two comparisons, and if this is related to those 60%, which is multicellular, probably involved in the development, you know, I mean, the genes that uh, are related in cancer belong not to division or to simple, no, simple one, uh, one cell behavior, but like multicellular group behavior. I mean, yeah. going into fine, you know, fine reading of that, what cancer genes are, you know? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think that's, that's, that's a very good point. Um, I think one thing we have to be careful of is that transcription little profiling is relatively easy, meaning we know how to do it, we can do it in large amounts. But it's but you're still looking at the hardware. Now, looking at the hardware, you can say some things about you can say a lot about a machine by looking at the hardware, but there's a lot you can't. Right. So so when you're looking at uh, at, at, at two uh, pieces of RAM, for example, that have different information, you can have a complete accounting of all the hardware, you know, where all the transistors are. You have no idea what the information is that's in there. And the biology is exactly the same way because these channels open and close post translationally. So, so yes, we can look at genes coming on and off, but I think it's just a, it's an underreporting of the interesting relationships we hope to see. I think it hides a lot because you're, you're making, you know, secondary inferences from the hardware. And I think the system, that's not really the way the system is running itself, you know? So what would be another way to make a more, you know, I would say meaningful relation, looking at the phenotype maybe, looking at different phenotypes? We need physiomic profiling. So I, I've been complaining about this for years now. It's very hard. We don't have any data sets to really look at. You know, people ask all the time with about aging, you know, does the bioelectrics of different organs change with aging? Nobody's looked, right? Uh, you know, or, or different, uh, different tissues in the body at different states of, um, you, you can find uh, in, in, in the geo database, you can find transcriptional analysis of channels that things become, you know, progressively more, uh, you know, higher stage cancer or whatever. But, but how about the resting potential? You know, there's such limited data. We, we did a meta analysis. That's the paper I was trying to find a minute ago. But um, uh, we did a meta analysis on every single measurement we could find in the literature on the bioelectrics that related to anything normal cancer there were only like 80 papers total in the whole of li the literature. That's it. And, and, and very, you know, methodologically lots to be desired. So uh, there's a massive opportunity to, for large scale profiling of, of physiomics. And it's hard because, you know, the reason uh, biochemistry and molecular biology took off in the, in the sixties is because you can do it on dead cells. You can take dead cells, you can fractionate them, you can get your DNA, your protein, your RNA, you know, this stuff, the, the bioelectrics disappears as soon as the cell is dead. You can't do it on fixed cells. If you fix the cell, it's gone. Right. So everything has to be in vivo. Everything has to be in native state. If you upset the tissue, it's all, it's, everything goes different. It's really tough. But that's where the future is. We have to um, have physiomic profiling. Yeah, you're just telling us we've been looking in the wrong place, basically, in order to find out what's going on. <laughs> I think so. I really think so. And I think, you know, people are, for sure, people are waking up to the idea of, ion channels as um, cancer targets. So there's some nice papers on ion channel drugs as cancer drugs, and, but largely people are still thinking about them as genes. And they say, oh, this channel is upregulated in my tumor, therefore I'm gonna block it. Maybe, but, but, but the driver is actually not the presence of the protein, the driver is the voltage. And the voltage might be, might be up or down depending on what the channel is doing. And I think until we get over this, um, sort of assumption that that the driving state is a is a genetic or or even proteomic state there's going to be a lot of confusion in the field you know we have to bite the bullet on the fact that the driver is the physiological pattern not the trans you know not the protein 
The reason I ask you the question of the pH is that um, in France, you know, the uh, collaboration between the cells and interaction, you need something that will happen at, in, at the level of the tissue. So, I mean, maybe if the electrostatic field is not the answer, uh, maybe the pH, because, you know, there is some interesting uh, demonstration that uh, lowering or uh, putting, you know, increasing the pH would, uh, would modify, you know, the behavior of cells, you know, and, but in not, not all cancers are the same, by the way. In some cancers, higher pH is better and others, lower pH is better. For example, kidney cancer is an example where the lower pH is, uh, is better. So that's why I asked the question about the pH. Maybe there is something by modulating the channels or the pH that you can influence the whole tissue in order to, to become uh, less aggressive, more differentiated. You know? could, could well be. And, 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 you know, these kinds of things can be modeled. We have a computational environment in which we model all this stuff. So uh, a particular tissue could be modeled to discover whether that's likely or not. I mean, I've heard anecdotally, I don't know if this is true or not, but, you know, there's this whole um, sort of alternative thing around alkalinization, right, and trying to alkalinize your tissues for to prevent cancer. I have no idea if that works or not, but I don't think it's a crazy strategy. You know, there are, I'm sure there are scenarios where the pH is a powerful driver of, of, the, of the VMEM. So certainly um, uh, in some preclinical all models, the alkalinization works real well. And Bob Gillies is a big proponent of this down at the Moffitt. Um, and it's really limited by the fact that you just can't get things alkaline enough for long enough uh, clinically, but it's there. there's no question that if you could, it would be a great strategy. Fantastic. Um, just to throw that out. Uh -huh. That's so, so to yeah follow up, uh, so the like the uh, Bob actually published two years ago, published the membrane just uh, regulates the you know the the, the different uh, uh, degree. So uh, he actually also used uh, uh, non-genetic information. So we actually right now we had a paper in press actually discuss the how much the non-genetic regulation existed, especially from topological point of view, because the membrane, you know, you separate is, uh, is actually information of topological information. So we actually found so many stuff, especially nowadays, some popular, like the, uh, you know, cellular, you know, condenser, all this, you know, so that's all the information is all about the information and how to modify the genetic and the non-genetic information is fundamentally, you know, fascinating to, to, to think about also yeah. including the, how to develop the field, everything. So for, Somehow, the, just the, the cell, the control system just let the physiological regulation to play the role in different stages. For example, early embryogenic, you do not need any gene to guide anything. They just by the self-organization to drive this whole process. And then they, they gradually they allow the gene to play the role and then I can talk over in charge of such a, such a thing. So that's why I ask the Michael, what, whether or not the cognition also have different stage of, you know, to take over because initially all the embryo just go, just dividing, right? You just yeah. finish it. And when you become the, the uh, cell become differentiation and then the gene the gradually, you know, get to this position and then the take the leadership and as such. So, so, so in that way, we actually realized that Different species, you could chimeric put them together, like the mice and the rats. They can put together actually development is fine, but the problem is such a package of information you cannot pass by. So that's a challenge for the nature. So we can artificially we can do an experiment to showing that is possible, but we did not showing. So we actually ask what the cell can do, but we did not ask what the cell does as a such a question, right? So so therefore we, so therefore they have different. Uh, what I'm saying is that they have different non-genetic program actually, but link this package by the genetics as a such. So that's, a, we actually really try to push. And I think we share the similar idea as, a, as this, including the Bob, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I unfortunately have to go. I've got a four o'clock meeting, but the, the great discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Uh, this concludes the Q&A sessions for the Cancer and Evolution Symposium. Thank you so much, all of you. It was, I will honestly miss doing this because I think there's something really fantastic about this whole process. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mike, for being Thanks here. So Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.